Well, thanks for joining us um, uh, on the on the program. I really appreciate your time. It's fantastic. Yeah, and thanks for um, picking up my book too. Yeah, well, it's a little bit hard not to pick up. This is the kind of book that, firstly, you know, attracts the eye. When I saw it, I thought, um, "Oh, this looks very interesting," because I, I immediately became familiar with the cover, as in, you know, what it is that the cover is portraying. Yeah. And these gold lines. Yeah. What I didn't realize at the time was the ancient art of kintsugi. Yes, yes. And Isn't that a great concept? Yeah, that is a great concept. And I love the way that you had uh, combined that with a book that's about the brain after a stroke, uh, amongst other things, and how my understanding of kintsugi was that when uh, some pottery or something made out of you know clay or something like that was damaged, uh, it was repaired with gold uh, to bring it back together so it can be used, but it was often also considered to be more beautiful than before. Mm, yeah, like it had a character or a sheen or an extra feature that it didn't have before. It had a sort of greater depth, perhaps. Yeah, absolutely. And in order to become more beautiful, it had to be bro is... broken first. When I came across your book, in the bookstore in Carlton in Melbourne. It was after I'd done mm -hmm. a circle of the table that it was on about three or four times and I didn't notice the book. And I walked away from mm. this table and went into this other section of books along psychology and other matters related to the brain. And for some reason, something made me come back to the table where, where your book was and it became very obvious that the book was there at the time, but uh, I'm not sure why I had missed it when mm. I was intently looking at that particular table beforehand. And when I became aware of it, uh, the title, How I Rescued My Brain, uh, was something that I related to immediately because that's the quest that I'm on, the quest to rescue my brain. And um, I picked it up and mm. purchased it because we were running out of time. The bookstore was closing. And I didn't get to read it until after I walked out of the door and sat down on the nearest bench and started to go through the prologue and the first couple of pages, and I was in tears within the third page. The book moved me because I, yes. <laughs> I, I automatically related to the story that you were telling. It was basically my story, and I think that other people will find this story very familiar, especially people that have experienced stroke what made it even more fascinating for me was that for the first time i personally had come across somebody and this is not a fantastic or great thing but had experienced a stroke but somebody who was intimately knowledgeable and aware of you know the goings on in the brain and in your career you were supporting people in many challenges with many challenges that were related to the brain but in this case, now you're able to, with all of that experience, reflect on your own experience with stroke. Can you start by telling me a little bit about what you did before uh, you wrote the book and before your experience with stroke? So essentially, I'd worked for over 20 years as a clinical and forensic psychologist. So about half the time I had therapy clients, about half the time I had uh, assessments and reports that I was doing for the children's court and the criminal court and I like the combination of both those things. Uh, I was married with three daughters and I think at that stage um, they were still all primary school um, and then I uh, you know I've always been a physically active person so I like exercising so at that time I was doing yoga and you know once a week a class and also ocean swimming and and walking um, and I like being in nature so I would like to do that so I think uh, you know on the face of it anyway I had everything together uh, you know the practice was very successful I had good colleagues I had a good network of friends so you know anybody looking from the outside uh, would have thought oh well, here is a successful person 
in, in you know in every way. Um, so things started to unravel before the stroke, however, and what happened was I started to notice that I was getting more physical aches and pains, like more backache. I had uh, I was getting abdominal pains, which turned out to be appendicitis, but it wasn't diagnosed for quite a long time. And also I was starting to not sleep as well. I was also starting to drink uh, more heavily. You know, I was never a big drinker, but I noticed that I found it difficult to go uh, through a day without having, you know, one or two glasses of wine. So that was new for me. And I was also starting to have nightmares and bad, you know, where bad things were happening, like to me or to my family or to friends. And I was also noticing that I didn't feel like talking with people as much and, and feeling generally more sad. And all, all of that turned out to be, uh, as I found out, um, trauma related to my work. So I was not only suffering post-traumatic stress disorder, trauma, but also depression. Uh, so that's the early part of the story. That's what was happening before the stroke. and. Because of that diagnosis, I went and saw a senior psychologist who I had a lot of respect for, and he made that diagnosis, and I also saw my GP to rule out any physical causes. All those things were happening before the stroke, and I decided to close my private practice for what I thought would be about six months, and I'd get well again and get back to work. Yeah. But things didn't quite turn out the way I had imagined. Yeah, I understand. Um... Curiously, when you're somebody with your background, so from my understanding, you were a psychiatrist or psychologist, were you? Yes. When, so when somebody with your background is going through the things that I imagine you're dealing with your clients on a regular basis and supporting them and giving them tools to get through and overcome, are you noticing yourself going through the challenges that your clients are presenting with? And is that how you began the process to start looking at what's going on with you and sought the help of your uh, colleague? Yeah, I think, I think Bill, I had, I had an advantage in that I had that professional background and experience. So I was started, started seeing, starting to notice that I had symptoms so, of depression and and trauma so you know I wasn't looking forward to work in the morning I wasn't sleeping so well I knew there were symptoms of depression and because I was having nightmares a lot of bad things happening I could see that that could be trauma related um, but the disadvantage was because I was I'd been a helping professional it had never crossed my mind that I would end up being somebody who needed help you know that I would be on the other side of the consulting desk so to speak yeah. so I th think it took me longer to, to accept the idea that I actually needed help and when I went and saw the clinical psychologist uh, that I, I mentioned it was because I wasn't sure I, I, I could tell him these things and he asked me lots of questions and at the end of that interview he said yeah, you've got stress disorder and the depression that goes with it. So he was very clear. And in fact, it was a relief then to hear him say that because I thought, oh, okay, I wasn't imagining it. It's not great to have these disorders, but uh, I wasn't imagining it. And that explains the way I've been feeling and mm. how I've been behaving a bit. Yep. Uh, I guess the advantage then was I was very open to getting, once I understood what I was wrong with me, getting help, and you know, being open to psychotherapy, um, and this is at the trauma stage, so I hadn't had the brain injury yet. So I understood what was going on. I was, you know, a good, good and willing participant. Yeah, well, that's a big advantage to have at least the background that you had, and you probably also then had been able to see your clients go from being in a similar position to you to overcoming those challenges and becoming better so you would have felt am i right in saying that you would have felt that there was hope for a great outcome 
Yeah, you, you're exactly right there, Bill. So because I'd seen many clients go through difficulties like depression, like trauma, and like many other difficulties and challenges in life, I knew that once you engaged in the process, and the process here was, you know, seeing a very experienced psychologist, doing therapy with him, doing the exercises that he asked me to do, I had a lot of faith in the process. So I thought, well, okay, it doesn't feel like it at the moment that um, I can change the way I feel, but because I, I had faith in the process, had seen it work for other, other people, I thought, well, I'll just stick with it, and it, you know, it's going to change things. But you never know, of course, how much it's going to change things and how long it's going to take. That's always an unknown. Yeah. So you imagined that it would be six months, but I know that. Like me, I imagine that my recovery after um, you know dealing with certain sh challenges related to uh, emotional well-being and mental well-being, as well as stroke, all, took a lot longer than I would have liked or anticipated. Um, and what I thought was going to take months took years. But what I think got in the way for me was the amount of time I put into my healing and my recovery. So most of my time was uh, focused towards my work and there wasn't enough life balance there. What was your work-life balance situation like? Mm. Okay, so once I realized that I had, you know, what is a very serious uh, mental health problem, trauma is very serious, and depression can be very serious as well. Uh, and with discussion with the psychologist, and he agreed, I took what I thought would be six months off my private practice. So I was self-employed, so I could do that. And I thought, well, I'll just devote my time to getting well again. Well, actually, once I stopped working, I got worse. So you probably, many of your listeners will know that sometimes you can hold things together when you need to, but as soon as you don't need to hold things together, then you fall apart. Wow. So that's actually a good sign really once you fall <laughs> once you fall apart uh, and you don't need to keep holding things together that's really the starting point and you can start to get well um, that, so what I did then was pretty much full-time try and try and get well is that rock bottom I, I think so um, I had a I had another rock bottom but that came later after the stroke so the rock bottom for me in that first phase was feeling so um, hopeless and useless and so fearful, you know, with trauma, you, you're actually very fearful or you're afraid something bad's going to happen a lot of the time. And there were a few times when I felt quite suicidal, you know, I get very black moods and I would think, well, I'm no use to anyone. I'm, you know, I'd be better off. It'd be better off for everyone else if I wasn't around. But what, what kept me on track and kept me hauling myself back into thinking, well, I'm, I'm not going to do that, is, is my three daughters' idea that I just didn't want them to grow up without their father. Um, so that was something that always kept me pulling me back on track. Plus, you know, I had a wife that I could speak to about those feelings and, and a couple of other good friends that... I could talk to about those really, really dark and deep feelings. And when I would talk about that, then I would always feel feel better and feel like I could get back onto to the road to recovery. Yeah, I know that for me, I've not had suicidal thoughts at all, but I've definitely had very dark and, you know, thoughts that were challenging to my well-being, but not in, not to that end. I was also, like you, motivated by my children and my wife and being around for them and making sure that I was a part of their lives and I didn't have a negative impact on, on their lives. Um, but with, uh, mm. with friends and family, I didn't really have anyone I could talk to until I sought the assistance of a psychologist who I saw once a week for mm. the first few months and then got to seeing her once every couple of weeks and then got to seeing her once for once a month and then stretched it out as I started to get through the things that were challenging me. Now that was early on in my my life in my mid twenties. But I used to find myself feeling really mm -hmm. frustrated when I would go to friends and family at the beginning, thinking that the best thing I could do was talk to them about it and then they weren't really 
um, equipped to handle the challenges that I was coming to them with, and I was making it very, mm. I was making it very difficult for them to help me, but also getting frustrated with them for not being able to support me or understand me. And I, I wonder the type of people that you were going to were they were were they colleagues in a similar sort of field that you were working in, or were they other people that you had just had a, an amazing relationship with over many years? Yeah, I think in they were both. So in one case, it was a a, a, a female friend who, uh, you know, is also a good friend of the family and just a very uh, good person to talk to, good listener, sympathetic, um, and non-judgmental, mm. and not you know who wouldn't get overwhelmed by me saying you know like I actually don't feel, wonder whether I want to keep on, on living, and she would say oh, we don't want that. It's not like she did anything amazing. It was just somebody who uh, was able to listen to what I was saying. Then I had a colleague who was also a mental health professional. I probably had a couple of those who, you know, could understand what I was experiencing, not just from their personal point of view, but because they had, you know, worked in that field as well. And I think one of the things that's difficult for friends or family of those who are having very strong emotional experiences is that they don't even have the language sometimes to explain or understand what it is that you're going through. Mm. And they can easily feel overwhelmed or fright or frightened by the intensity of emotion, particularly if they've never experienced the same thing. And so for various reasons, unless they've been through something similar, I often find it's those who've been through some other life crises and come through it okay, they're less scared to hear what somebody's going through and less overwhelmed by it. Uh, So part of this process of recovery is about finding those people who can listen to and manage the types of thoughts and feelings and sometimes behaviors that you're going through without being overwhelmed or frightened by it. Yeah, I think it's really important um, to discuss that part of it because you and I are now talking about just mental well-being, and we haven't yet spoken about the impact of stroke on, you know, people and the stress that that causes and how it influences people's mental well-being one way or the other. So this is really important because if you have these tools to deal with the challenges that life throws at you just on a day-to-day basis, then at least I felt that when I got to my stroke journey, uh, say almost uh, 15 years after I'd first started to see a psychologist, I was very well positioned to deal with the emotional challenges that stroke created for me. And as a result of that, it was less traumatic, although very serious, and although I required rehabilitation and had to learn how to walk again and it's been six a six year journey so far um, I still felt like I was in a lot more better space after stroke than I had been in my early years when I hadn't really experienced anything that was too dramatic as far as my health was concerned how do you Mm. how do you relate to that part of the next part of your life. So you've gone through the process, you've experienced a stroke, and then you've overcome the challenges that you were faced with as a quote unquote normal person um, who hadn't experienced a stroke but was experiencing some mes- mental well being challenges. How did that support you in your stroke recovery? What, what I would say is that, you know, commenting on your experience, Bill, is that, you know, when we first have a major life challenge like the one you're describing in your early 20s and like the one I was describing having where I experienced a trauma and depression and you get through that then you realize that you've got you know personal strength resilience Mm. greater than what you imagined and so there's a sense well okay um, life dealt me that blow so perhaps I'm more resilient than I thought and I can deal with with other blows if they should come along. And also by that stage, you've experienced that, you know, being vulnerable, being fragile, having to reach out for help. And 
that when you do reach out for help, it makes a real difference and that we can't do these things on our own. So you're more likely to be resourceful, more likely to ask for help, more likely to do the things that people suggest to you to do. So I think there are a couple of factors where if you've been through some crisis before and a big one like a stroke comes along, a brain injury, well then uh, you're a bit more open to a asking for help and also realising, okay, this is a big challenge but I've been through challenges before and I got through them. Yeah, that's, that's excellent. Now, can you tell me a little bit about what you noticed when you started to experience your stroke? Uh, so what was the uh, the symptoms that you experienced and um, how did it unfold? It happened during the night and during the night, it was just a normal day, normal night. I got up during the night with a headache and, and I can't even say now how bad the headache was, but it was bad enough that I thought I need to get out of bed and take a Panadol. And I think I took one or two Panadol and then just went back to bed. The next memory I have really uh, is, and I didn't know at the time, but I was actually in the hospital waiting room at the uh, emergency department. My wife had rushed me to hospital because she'd found me wandering around the house early morning dressed as if I was going to work. Well, this is like, you know, been uh, a year and a half, in fact, before I uh, last worked. So it was ridiculous that I was dressed in my work clothes let alone up so early wow. but also I was just wandering around the house saying what what am I supposed to be doing and she would say well it's a school holidays and you're meant to be taking two of the girls to their school camp well I had no idea that I was meant to do any of that or that it was school holidays and she just tell me that answer and then a few minutes later apparently I would ask her the same question again so that's when she cottoned on that something was seriously wrong um, she said, I felt very cold to touch and I even looked very green. So uh, she organized a, a friend to, to take care of the girls and then rushed me to hospital. And my first memory, as I say, is of being in the hospital waiting room, just being, you know, sort of interested in what this place was and what these people were doing there. I wasn't particularly um, freaked out by it. But then I noticed that, um, you know, nurses and then doctors would come to me, you know, they took me into a room and they were asking me questions, which I found difficult to answer because I actually noticed that I'd forgotten a lot of things. I, I just seemed not to be able to remember dates. And I was asked who the prime minister was. I couldn't remember who it was. And mm. I didn't even know where I was. I, I, I only worked out I was in a hospital because eventually somebody told me that. And I thought, oh, that's a that's a hospital I think I've been to before when my wife was giving birth to our to our daughters. So it, it was a slow puzzle that I was putting together. And that first 24 hours, I was pretty much out of it. That first day felt like it may have been an hour long, but, you know, it's 24 hours. And the next day I was a bit more with it and I understood that I was in a hospital. Something serious had happened, but even though the doctor would come and say, oh, we're having a look at your brain, it didn't really register what the import of that was. And I kept noticing that time seemed to be slipping by. You know, I'd be I'd look at the clock and think, wow, you know, another hour has gone by, and I thought that was just a minute. So my main symptom at that time was, was amnesia and disorientation. You know, if I walked out of that ward, I would have just been totally lost. I would have had no idea how I got there or where I was meant to be going. So that was the main symptom. And then three weeks after that, uh, an MRI was done on my brain, and that's when the diagnosis of stroke was actually made. And it discovered that um, the vision area of my brain had been damaged and part of the left temporal lobe, which has a lot to do with understanding conversation and also memory or, you know, where you are, so mm. sort of geographical memory. That's why I kept losing where I was. And that's why also conversation was very difficult. I had, had a bit of right-sided weakness. The, it was the left uh, vertebral artery on, at the rear of the, the brain. So, so I had a, a bit of right-sided weakness, but I didn't have any loss of mobility. I just felt incredibly weak, like I was an old man. And, um, 
you know, I would hold things in my right hand and sometimes they would just just, just, just drop for, for no good reason. So in that first few weeks, I felt like sometimes that I was just dreaming it all. I was not always sure that what was happening was real. Mm. But because I wasn't sure, I thought, okay, best to just pretend or act as if these things are really happening, that this person speak to me, speaking to me is real, so I'll answer his or her questions. And it was a very, very sort of in-between world experience. Yeah, I think uh, in the beginning of your book, you mentioned a lot of those things um, and I related to that and found myself getting quite emotional at the beginning of the the book when I read mm. it and uh, realized that you're basically saying what it is that I experienced. What I'm curious to know about is, um, firstly, what kind of stroke did you have? Uh, well, I had a blood clot in the, the left a vertebral artery, the, the rear one, and um, the reason for that blood clot is not clear. It was never discovered why I had it. So my understanding is 10, 20% of strokes happen for no identifiable medical cause. Uh, my, you know, my arteries were ch checked out and they're all fine. Uh, so it's possible I mean, it was suggested to me by the ophthalmologist who was the one who diagnosed that I'd lost a quarter of my vision. She said, maybe you had a sudden increase in blood pressure and possibly, you know, that could have happened as a result of a nightmare because I was waking up sometimes during the night, you know, in a cold, cold sweat, sometimes afraid that I, I was about to be killed. Mm. Uh, so it's quite possible that my blood pressure suddenly increased. But you know, it was explained to me that, you know, little bits of um, material in the arteries can be floating around that does cause a blood clot, not because there's any pathology, just, just a random thing. Mm. Um, so I forgot, my, I forgot what your question was no, now. That's but, okay. That was the question. It was basically what it was that caused it and mm. what, what type of stroke you had. That's okay. So, so what were some of the challenges that, you and the family faced after stroke so for me i had a lot of challenges around getting back to work and getting active again i couldn't afford to be out of work um, it caused a lot of challenges with the family with regards to you know my extended family the concern and they're unable to really be supportive in any way that was helpful to me and that was frustrating to me they were able to pick me mm. up and drive me places but that was frustrating also because i had to get people there when they were available rather than when I was available. So I found those early days of stroke recovery were probably the hardest, but as things started to come back on for me, um, where uh, my ability started to come back, my memory started to improve, I was able to drive after several months, uh, I started to really appreciate my independence again. What was it like immediately after the stroke for you after those first few months? I, I think there was all going through all those routine medical tests. Uh, the, the local physician put me through to try and identify the cause. I was very concerned I might have a follow-up stroke mm. because there's a you know an increased chance of having a second stroke after the first one. Yeah. And what I read was that the second stroke is more likely to be fatal mm. than the first one. So I was pretty pretty worried, um, and no one else seemed to <laughs> share that anxiety. Um, I think the family, the immediate family, I had young children, so they really had no concept of mm. what I was experiencing. And we were also under a lot of financial stress by this time because we'd used up all our savings. Uh, the global financial crisis hit, so what investments we had were difficult to get good value from. We sold everything we could. Mm. So we're under enormous financial strain and we had to get get financial help from the extended family. So all of that was an added stress, which was really not helpful in terms of recovery. So I had to focus a lot on that, a bit like you saying, you know, financially you had to get back to work and stuff. Um, there was a lot of concerns around how we could survive financially. So besides that, then I had to work out, well, how do I get better? Because I was what was called the walk and talk stroke. Uh, you know, I, my my stroke was actually diagnosed some weeks after I left hospital. Mm. 
so there was no rehab that I could do. You know, like it was told, I learned, only learned this later. Unless you've got physical mobility problems or speak, speech or swallowing problems, yeah. there's actually no rehab or there wasn't. So I was left with the instructions from my physician, which was to just rest as much as possible and don't do anything harder than read the newspaper. Well, in the end, I was pretty unsatisfied with that. So that's when I started my investigation of what else could I do to improve my recovery. And fortunately, um, I had an insurance policy, an income protection policy, which finally finally kicked in after a while, like when we were so desperate, I made a claim, unsure whether we'd be covered, but I was. So suddenly we had some income uh, and um, they actually sent me along to a neuropsychologist about six months after the stroke. Wow. And I'd noticed I was finding conversa conversation very tiring, very difficult. I was needing to sleep a lot during the day. Noises were really bothersome. Having the children around the the house was really tiring because they would just make children's noises and run around and that, you know, that would actually f feel like it was physically stabbing into my brain. Yeah, wow. Yep. And, uh, you know, my, my wife didn't understand, you know, the neurology of it or, or what, what was needed. And of course I couldn't explain that either. I'd never been through something like this before. Mm. Um, so there was very little immediate help, but as I got a bit clearer and like you, you know, my memory started to come back, I had this neuropsych assessment and basically what he said was that your main area of, def of um, deficit is in auditory processing, so processing sounds, so mm. many things like language. Mm. So my visual memory actually was very good, but my verbal memory, so... I couldn't have not. Ha I could not have had a conversation like we're having now because you would have asked me a question, and halfway through my answer, I would have totally forgotten. Uh, you know, halfway through the first sentence, I would have forgotten what you asked me or what I actually said. Yeah. So my verbal memory was totally shot, and I realised from my own training as a psychologist, I'd done some neuropsychology assessments and training before. Processing uh, was the thing I needed to work on. So that's when I discovered that there was a brain training program, a computer based one, that could help you train with auditory processing. Now those programs are pretty common, but in that time they were quite new. And I worked out the program that would be best for me. And I started a regimen of doing that every day, the exercises every day. But I could only do half an hour because I would get so mentally fatigue even when I did that in the morning so I never got more than half an hour but after six weeks I noticed a real improvement my auditory processing improved conversations were better I was remembering things that I was told and what I was saying much mm -hmm. better and it was around that time that I thought wow you know I, I this is really working and also physical exercise was starting to kick in a bit more I could walk further uh, so I was gradually improving the amount of exercise I did. And eventually I, I um, joined a Pilates studio because I, one of the uh, effects of the stroke was I couldn't lower my head down. I'd get incredibly dizzy. Somehow it had affected the vestibular system, the balance system in the brain. Mm -hmm. So even unloading the dishwasher or picking something off the floor would make me woozy just mm -hmm. from dizziness. So the Pilates training meant that I could do all, all the exercises either flat on my back or on my stomach or standing upright or sitting upright, you know, because of the machines that they have. So I couldn't go back to yoga for quite a while. I couldn't go back to uh, ocean swimming for quite a while because the waves go up and down. But mm. I was able after a while to go back to the pool where, you know, you're not going up and down. So it was a gradual process. Um, over many, many months uh, to find out what I could do and and what I couldn't do. Your story is so familiar. I mean, that's one of the reasons I contacted you, but also because I love it when other people tell their story because then it's easier for me to have somebody that I know, somebody that um, I struggle to explain things to, similar to you, struggling to explain things to your wife, 
um, mm. to just listen to somebody else talk about it because that way um, they can relate mm. to the experience as a wife that they noticed. But now from your words, they know like what it was that I was going through and they see that this is not just me at the time mm. imagining it or um, having trouble iterating it or whatever. It was actually part of the mm. stroke and it was something that it was new to me and how was I meant to get the message across? Um, the challenge with the children was, mm -hmm. was what I faced, you know, the challenge with um, therapy at the beginning because I had a bleed uh, in February 2012. Then I had a second one six weeks later. Again, there wasn't any physical, so um, mm. obvious physical issues. So I missed out on having a neuropsych assessment. My neuropsych assessment was six months after the initial challenge. And it was then discovered that I had problems with uh, being able to make a conversation, understand what I was being asked, respond to a question, um, remember who it was that came to visit me. So um, these things, I think, mm. are very common experiences that people that ex experience stroke um, go through and, and, ex and suffer. So what I hope is I hope that carers come across these episodes, specifically these kind of episodes, so that they can get a feel for uh, what it is that uh, their loved one is going through. What was it like for your wife to be on the receiving end? Have you ever had a conversation with her to understand what she was going through? Yes. Um, I, I tried to explain to her as I worked out, you know, what things would impact on me and what didn't and so you know like a typical question she might say is uh, just an example of a question which was frustrating for her and frustrating for me she might say you know what would you like for dinner tonight she was a very good cook and had sort of taken over the cooking role in the family mm. um, and I found that question really difficult to answer because for a start I had trouble remembering dishes, you know, food. I mm. couldn't remember. It was like everything. It, it was like the world. The world, of course, was going at the same pace that it, it had ever gone on, but it was like I was in slow motion or the world had speeded up. So somebody in the world would ask a question or say something in the normal way that they always would, but for me, it was different. It was it, For me, it was like they were talking really quickly or they re re wanted to really quickly and I would ask answer that question by trying to remember dishes that you know we ate or that mm. she cooked so that was one thing and then I had to decide well, what what is my preference that was another thing again mm. and then I had to remember the words to explain that so you know I often say in those early days it was like um, you know English was a second language for me it wasn't my first language it was like a second language that I was trying to think in uh, so it was very frustrating for her and eventually I would s explain to her and to the girls that you know my brain would get sore and uh, you know that I'd say if you make lots of noises I get a sore brain mm. and I remember saying one <laughs> once to my wife oh look um i can't answer your question right for her it was just a simple question not not necessarily about cooking could be anything mm. it might just require a yes or no answer and i'd say oh, look i'm i can't answer your question right now i've got a sore brain and a sore brain was like i can't actually think at all and you know just having this conversation is really hurting me mm. i remember saying to her once well i've got this sore brain i can't answer your question. she said well, when will your brain be right again? You know, like <laughs> really frustrated. Mm. And of course, there's no way I could answer that question either. Um, so I don't think she ever truly understood mm. uh, what I was experiencing at all. And my my situation was that you know our marriage became more and more strained as things gone on, and we ended up becoming divorced uh, a, a couple of years after the the stroke. So I don't think I've ever, although we're on friendly terms now and that's okay, mm. we've never had a, a proper conversation. She didn't really want to talk about it anymore. So 
I've just had to leave it be. But I know she didn't fully understand what I was experiencing, and that's just common for all sorts of families. Yeah. It's not particular to me. No, I don't think so. I think a lot of people would relate to that. And the fact that it happens to a lot of people, perhaps this conversation will just allay some people's concerns and um, give people the opportunity to just you mm-hmm. know, walk away and not get too overwhelmed by these conversations that seem to go nowhere because we couldn't make them you know, go anywhere because we were not capable at that point in time. Mm-hmm. Um, so you're, mm. you're quite a number of years down the track now, and I wonder, have you got back to your practice, uh, as a psychologist? Uh, no, I haven't. So, I mean, if I had, if I had just had the stroke, it's possible that I could have got back to the type of work I was doing before, but probably, you know, less hours because I still do get mental fatigue after a lot of concentration or a lot of conversation. Um, But because I've had the trauma, the trauma came out of my work. Mm. So it's essentially listening to, you know, the trauma stories of many, many people over 20 years. And I had worked in the prison system as well and had seen a lot of um, bad behavior. And at times, you know, I've had my life threatened uh, during the course of my work. So it was agreed really by my psychologists, my other treating doctors, that I should never go back to that work again, the clinical work, the face-to-face work, because it could trigger, you know, another episode of trauma. So even though I don't live with the, the constant symptoms of trauma these days, there's occasionally I avoid things, you know, where I see bad things on the news happening to people or certain stories, particularly around children, I, I tend to avoid because I know that they, uh, um, they're they the ones that I'm most sensitive to. Mm-hmm. So for that reason, I haven't gone back to, to that work. But what happened and what can happen out of a crisis like this when it all seems negative is a positive can happen. And the positive has been for me that, when I got well enough, I thought, well, gee, I, I, I really feel like maybe there's a story here that I could write that would help other people. Because I'd found hearing other people's stories and reading other people's stories invaluable. Mm. And these were the stories of other people that had been through, you know, stroke or brain injury or other major life crises. And just, just that they could get through them, they've experienced the frustrations that, that both you and I have been talking about. Uh, gave me a lot of confidence and a lot of hope. So I thought, well, maybe my way of giving back to all those people who are yet to come uh, is to is to write my story. And then I, you know, made contact with the Writers' Centre. I'd always enjoyed writing, but I'd never done it in uh, outside of my professional writing. Mm. And, um, you know, I spoke to one of the writing consultants. He said, oh, look, I think that's a fantastic story. So... Then I went away and wrote a few things, showed it to him and said, yeah, look, the content is good, but you just need to improve your writing skills because mm-hmm. professional writing as a psychologist is very different, very different from writing, you know, in a narrative way. Like, you know, when you read a novel where you yeah. you just feel like you're in the story because the writer has just used all the right ways of getting you into the story. Mm. So I went and did some writing courses on narrative writing, you know, which took me almost a year. and. And uh, and practice a lot, and and then uh, you know I pitched the story at a, a writers festival, and there were publishers there, and they said, oh yeah, we'd like to publish that. And so now my main occupation is writing and uh, you know speaking, uh, and and though I actually really really love it, so I, I write about you know psychology things, health related things. So I'm still drawing on my background. But I'm telling stories in a way that I, I didn't before and couldn't do before. Yeah, well, I certainly resonated with your book. I um, also had an opportunity to tune into some of your YouTube uh, videos the, where you're speaking on different topics uh, at different locations. And I thought they were uh, really fabulous to listen to. And to read the book uh, really touched me and really made it possible for me to feel like there was somebody else out there 
that knew me and understood me and experienced what I experienced and explained it a lot better than I've been able to explain it. So the, the mm. book is an invaluable tool that I could hand to somebody and say, if you want to know what I'm going mm. through, just read it, read the book and understand. Mm. And I think that's really one yeah. thing that was missing for me. I had a lot of com communication with stroke survivors, a lot of connections. I know a lot of people from the community, um, but I'd never had a tool that I could pick up and say, here guys, like read that and take out the word David and replace it with Bill and 80% of the time, it's you know what it is that I've experienced mm. or, or gone through in one way or another. So I am so glad that you got to mm. put your previous experience of being a psychologist and use those skills to translate what you went through into a story because um, it's just so helpful and uh, I think it's going to make a big difference to a lot of people. I expect you will already had mm. some amazing feedback from other people who read it. Tell me about some of those interactions. What has it been like for others who have picked up your book? Well, you know, like you're saying things that have, other readers have told me too, Bill, and it's so gratifying because, you know, you tell your story or your experience and you just don't know how it's going to resonate for other people. Mm. So certainly, you know, it's, had a big impact in the stroke community, both here and overseas. And, uh, you know, the book's been out for a few years now and I still get uh, emails um, or contacts from people saying, oh, I've just picked up your book or, you know, thank you for this. And some people said it's been life changing, you know, like it's the best advice they've ever had. And I remember when the book came out and I was doing the, you know, on the writer's tour around Australia and Sometimes I remember one young woman who it had a brain injury when she was quite young and she was still a young woman and, you know, she, she um, uh, obviously had a huge amount of energy even though um, speech was a bit jerky and her body movements were a bit jerky. And before this talk, which I gave at a library, um, you can't help but notice the audience, you know, and what they're like before mm. you start to present. And I noticed her and she was sitting right up the front and I thought, oh, here, here's trouble. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, she was nonstop talking to whoever it was, was around and she's moving around a lot. But once I started talking, she was a bit transfixed, absolutely still, mm -hmm. and not a word out of her until the presentation. She asked a really good question. And uh, afterwards, she came up to me with her mother. Her mother happened to be there as well. And she said, David, I've learned more from you in this one hour than I have over the years from all the health experts that mm. I've been to. Yeah. So, you know, who knows how true that is. But clearly she, she um, was very engrossed in, in the story and the way I was telling the story and obviously related to it. And then there was another young a young boy there who was looked like a teenager and he came with his mother as well, came up to me afterwards and said, um, you know, thank you very much. He, he, he was obviously a very shy person, hmm. but he looked me in the eye and said, thank you very much. This is, you know, <clears throat> it's been really wonderful. And his mother explained that, you know, I'd mentioned about the suicidal feelings and he particularly had related to that and felt a lot more hope. Um, so I've had other people, people who've not had strokes, not had brain injuries, not had trauma, but there's something in the story that they resonate with and they, um, you know, say for whatever reason, you know, this is this has really touched me or given me some hope or given me ideas or if you can get through it, I can get through it. Um, you know, all those sorts of things. Yeah. Um, the book was picked up in the UK by an agency that recommends books to health professionals to give out to patients and so it's been picked up so it means it's available in most of the libraries in the UK I understand mm. so that was another really gratifying thing because I really wrote the book for you know all the people that would need to hear another story and I guess the publisher was interested in this story not because not only because it was a survivor story but because it was also somebody who had my background and you you know, I had a sort of an insight where I could talk from both 
points of view, you know, as a mental health person and also as somebody with a lived experience going th through it. And perhaps that's what you picked up on when you mm -hmm. said, you know, like I was, the book explains things that perhaps other stroke survivors haven't been able to explain. Yeah, absolutely it does. And the other thing about the book and your story particularly is that you're a health professional and I don't wish for health professionals to experience stroke. The challenge with them being health professionals that haven't experienced stroke is they don't have really any idea how to support people within stroke recovery other than what they've learned in books. And although what they've learned in books is very valuable mm. and, and important, it's just like me going mm. to a, mm. a motor mechanic and telling him you know, how to fix my foot. I mean, he can see it and go, look, it's broken and you should probably mm. do something with that. But he's a motor mechanic and he knows how to fix cars who's never had a broken, mm. a broken foot. So the opportunity, yeah. to, the opportunity to get you to tell your story makes it a lot easier for me to you know, uh, connect to you because of your experience. And I didn't want that for you, but the fact that you've done mm. that and you've been through that and you have your background and your studies mm. and all the things that you've done is just the type of person that I need, need, needed to be speaking to early on about my recovery. Um, and, I mm. and I refer back to yes. you know, Jill, yeah. Jill Balti taylor who is a famous um, neuroscientist mm -hmm. who studies brains and all the things that we need to know about brains in relation to stroke because she's experienced her own, uh, she's you know, had her own stroke and now she's coming from that place of somebody who's in the box seat to, to deliver, you know, solutions that are related to stroke recovery from a stroke patient's perspective. So that's what I get from you as well. And that's why I think it was mm. important for us to talk and to get the message out further and to share the knowledge that you have and also to make sure that more people can get a hold of your book. Um, and that being said, is, mm. this, is this somewhere where you would like people to go to if they're interested in getting a copy of your book? Uh, but I, I think largely um, it's available in all the online bookstores. Um, some of the physical bookstores have it, as you discovered. Mm. But um, these days, most of the online bookstores hold it. And it's also an audio book. So I recorded the book and it was it's put out by Belinda. It's available on Audible. So you can download the book as an audio book, which can be really helpful for people who are having difficulty with reading after their their brain injury yes. and I might also say that I'm, the, the new book the new book I'm working on is an extension of of this one it's not so much about me but what I realize is exactly the thing you're saying is that when you've been through a major life experience like stroke like brain injury like trauma you just have a a, a deeper feeling for what it's like to go through that it's a, it's an understanding that you just cannot get through book learning. So the the new book's going to be about people who've been through a range of major life crises, how they survive them, but also perhaps even more importantly, how they've grown in positive ways mm. and what helps what helps people to grow after a major life crisis. So exactly how do we support people going through a major life Life crisis during the crisis or you know immediately afterwards but in the longer term what helps people to grow so we don't want this thing to happen in the first place but it's happened so we can't pretend not otherwise so given it's happened how can we make the best of it and sometimes uh, people say well actually you know what happened I'm really glad in a way because I'm a much much better person uh, that's not always the case but often people will grow in ways that they become a different type of person or have different values in life, and they're very grateful for that. So the new book's going to be about that type of thing. So I'm hoping that it'll be an extension from from uh, How I Rescued My Brain. Well, I'm looking forward to getting my hands on a copy of that one as well and keeping in touch with the other work that you do. I can definitely relate to what you said. I know that a lot of people can't say what I'm about to say, but... I, I can, so I will say it, despite, in spite of the challenges that I, that, I, that I deal with on a daily basis because of what my stroke has uh, created and left for, for me, 
uh, it's the best thing that ever happened to me. Uh, it's not easy and it's uh, mm. my life is not the same as it was beforehand. It's certainly my life is not as easy uh, as it was beforehand. And I'm not talking about work financially, all that kind of stuff. I'm just talking about the day to day overcoming fatigue, mm. that type of thing. But it's the best thing that ever happened to me. It's made me a different version of myself, mm. one that I prefer than the one that that uh, I used to be, the version of myself that I used to be. It's allowed me to connect with amazing people, your, you know, like yourself and everyone else. Mm. And I've learned and I've offered a mm. lot more. I've given a lot more back than I had ever given back to people who were in need. So um, hopefully yeah. other people experiencing a stroke can get to the point where they feel that it has also had a positive impact on their life. Um, and um, that's what I wish for everybody, and that's what I wish for you, and I really, really appreciate you making yourself available and um, being a part of the program. I will, um, I'll, I'll, I will follow your, uh, your next instalment with interest. Well, thank you, Bill. Thank you for the good work that you're doing. It's wonderful that you've created this format to share stories of other people and not only provide hope, but... Uh, and inspiration, but, you know, practical guidance. So congratulations to you. Thank you so much, David. I really appreciate it. And uh, I wish you well uh, in your ongoing journey and, uh, and just keep doing all the good work that you do. I really appreciate what you do and the fact that you wrote this book. Uh, it's touched me and it's made a difference in my life. So thank you.